saying, say I'm gonna do a bunch of lunges and body weight squats and pull up some push-ups. And the next day I go in, I'm gonna do some more body weight squats, but then some bench pressing and just kind of like sporadic all over the place. Like sure you're getting some work done, but it's not going to build for a run program. So it's kind of like stacking up miles for say training for a marathon, right? Like if you just went out and just randomly ran every day and the distances were all over and there's no steady build to it, it's not good. you're going to get fit sure but you're not going to perform that well when it comes to race day and the same goes for strength training so lack of progression is probably the biggest thing i see over time we have several different topics we're going to talk about strength training for runners strategies to implement consistent strength training and how to really stick with it for longer than a week when to do strength training should you do it before you run after you run on separate days like how many times per week should we be doing at what intensity should the strength training be done common mistakes that we should avoid so there's definitely a lot there Kyle is a strength conditioning and running coach he's also an absolute beast of an endurance athlete the, <laughs> the different adventures that he goes on you can check him out on instagram as well what was it again Kyle? 100 mile Kyle. Yes, 100 mile Kyle. There you go. So he's also really into mountain adventures, into climbing. He's located in Bellingham, Washington. He does individual coaching and strength training as well for ultra runners and for road runners. Coach Kyle has put together four really good follow along videos for Path Projects. So Path Projects, the running clothing company that both Brian and I here on the call are a part of. Kyle is one of our ambassadors, one of our strength coaches, endurance athletes out there. And we basically just asked him, we have seen how much stuff that he has done with strength training for runners. So he created this series and you can find those four videos at pathprojects.com slash blog and those are easy to follow along workouts you basically you can just hit play you can follow them along and that's what i personally use on the daily as well brief intro about me i'm the co-founder of path projects we started this running company running clothing company about five years ago and I'm super excited to partner with guys like Kyle to really help bring some of the educational content for athletes out there i'm also the host of a running podcast the extra milest show is also a YouTube channel. So I'm super excited to actually talk on a daily basis about running and to help other runners out there. I'm personally training for the Tokyo and London Marathon, going to be setting up several different events also with Path. So I look forward to meeting several of you guys in person. Let's start at the beginning over here. A lot of runners understand the importance of strength training, but quite a few people don't do that much strength training. Do you have any strategies to implement strength training on a consistent basis and actually stick with it longer than just one week? Because we often see that initial excitement and then kind of after a few weeks that might fade again. So just curious to hear your thoughts there. Sure. So I think one of the biggest problems that people have in terms of implementing strength work into a run program is kind of twofold. The first is that they jump into it at such an intensity level that it starts to negatively impact their run performance. And so after that initial kind of excitement wears off, they notice their run performance starting to drop because they're training too hard in the gym and they're not using it in a way that's an accessory piece to improving their run performance. So one thing that I find most common with runners is that I have them scale back their strength training actually is they go in too hard, they beat themselves up, their run suffers, and then they kind of you know, stop the strength training. So the first thing I always tell people is you're probably doing too much if you're having a hard time finding it sustainable to balance with your running. The second thing is, is I find most people, they just kind of bounce around between a lot of like, kind of, I call them the sexy exercises, right? You're not following a steady progressive build over six to eight months. Rather, you're going in and just generally throwing together some leg work and just kind of, there's no, there's no pattern and growth over a period of time. When the reality is the workouts really shouldn't look that different over the course of a four, six, eight week block. They should be more progressive with weight, reps, kind of intensity of the movements. And so having an actual built program out over a six to eight week plan really helps you stick to it more, just like a running plan. If you know what your plan looks like for the next three months, it's a lot easier to follow through it rather than just showing up at the gym and grabbing six random leg exercises out of the air and just kind of jumping into them. So kind of the two things is balancing intensity and also actually developing some sort of structure around it rather than just winging it and kind of going kind of by the seat of your pants. And I think the, the part as well about doing too much too soon I think one good measurement there is 
the soreness level. Because I hear quite a few times from athletes of like, all right, starting to implement strength training. And all of a sudden, I'm so sore that I either can't run for a few days, or I can barely lift my arms for a few days. And I've, I've personally been like part of that as well. Where I start to go crazy on the pull-up bar, do way too many too soon. And you have to take mm-hmm. four days off be- before you're recovered again, right? And so finding that balance of backing off at the right time so you can show up again recover well and then and then do it again and if you're new to it there's always no matter how no matter what your first few days in there's always going to be a a week to 10 days of kind of that initial ripping of the band-aid off where it is going to beat you up a little bit more even if the intensity is about right but beyond that kind of you know my rule for my runners is always that your strength work should never ever negatively impact your priority run performance so if you have two to three important runs a week your strength work should never decrease your performance in those, especially after that first week. You know, the first week, like I said, you're going to get a little laid up. It's just the nature of the beast. But beyond that, it should always be a positive part of your week in terms of performance. Yes, well said. Here was one question by Stefan. Do you do strength training and running on the same day? And in what order? Sure. And that's a very common one to get thrown out there is kind of order of operations, right? And what I usually tell people with that is the first the first thing to kind of analyze is does my strength work is the goal of it solely focused on my run performance or do I have secondary goals do I have aesthetic goals do I do other things like my cycling climbing doing something else that I also am trying to get my strength work built towards so for the sake of this conversation I'm just kind of always going to speak in the vein of the strength work is specifically focused only for run performance and with that I always try to have people have what I call A runs and B runs through a week where you have one to three runs that are your priority runs. And those are the runs that we really want to focus on the performance of the run. And around that, we always want to try to have about 36 hours between a heavy strength session and that run, because that will give even a hard gym session time to be recovered from. On your non-days that are kind of your B-list runs, you can stack that strength work, whatever is going to get it done through your day on top of that run. So it's much more a personal preference than it is a physiological response. So if my big runs, my long run for the week is on a Saturday and a Wednesday, but the rest of the days are calm junk miles or more of a shakeout run, those days, it's whatever you are going to be able to get in and get the work done is what's going to be the best bet for you. So in terms of the physiological responses, it's negligible. You can ask 100 experts and you're going to get 100 answers. And so I always default to whatever will get you into both of those on those off days. Do that on important priority run days. You really shouldn't be stacking the straight worth before the run. There's less harm in going in after, depending on kind of the distance and intensity of the run. You're obviously going to be in a little more fatigue state so on priority run days always after on days that the runs are more just kind of filler runs it doesn't matter in terms of before after yeah spot on i have one i have one additional thought to add to that and that is sometimes some of the people on this call here they have busy family lives they have kids they have work they have a lot of other things going on and the stress levels might already be pretty high If at that point like sometimes i'm looking at let's say you do a high intensity run and a long run or like a temp, like basically two sessions a week, like if, sure. if I would be doing that. And I would be doing two or three strength trainings a week. Yep. Sometimes I on purpose try to do the strength training after, after the high intensity run, that that is mm-hmm. my day that my cortisol levels are going to be high. Yep. So that my recovery on some of these other days I have, otherwise I would sometimes have five high cortisol level like days in the week. And that on top of high stress levels, it's already quite a bit for me. Yeah. So sometimes I try to stack it that it's like, all right, I have two or three days that are going to be higher intensity or higher cortisol levels. And the other days are more of a recovery kind of thing. So I think even there, it's different for athletes as well of how much recovery you have outside of training, right? Yep. And I would rather an athlete stack strength work on the days they are doing big efforts outdoors rather than sprinkling them in between because your body's primed. The the weight you are moving in the gym might be less than if you were going in completely fresh. But the fact is like your body's primed, everything's activated and ready, even if you've gone out for a lot of miles. And so I would rather someone on big days stack the strength work after the long effort or the harder effort rather than taking the rest of the day off and then having pretty much you get in a rhythm of like every other day ends up being a hard day, whether it's in the gym or out on the road. And so like you said, you just never get that total release. So 
Yeah. 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 What are some common mistakes that you see runners make around the topic of strength training? Probably the most common is not actually progressing a program. It's they go in, say, two times a week, three times a week to the gym, 30, 45 minutes. And the workouts, if you zoomed out over the course of two months and looked at them, there's no real steady linear progression when there really should be. And that can be in the form of volume or load moves. And so it's not exciting, but really, like I said earlier, over a six or eight week program, the primary movements in a workout in a six to eight week block really shouldn't change that much. It's more about building them, whether you're trying to do more of an endurance based thing where you're increasing volume over time, increasing load, meaning the weight or time under tension that you're using. And so really over a six or eight week block, the workouts should look the same and the progression should be pretty steady through it. And at the end of whatever time period you're working through, that's kind of the time to then change the movements up. So for example, if I'm doing a six week block where I'm back squatting and I'm doing kind of a progressive build where I start really high volume and then I decrease the reps and I increase the weight over eight weeks. At the end of that, maybe I'm tired of back squatting. And so at the end of that, I'm going to change that to a front squat for the next six to eight weeks. So a similar movement pattern, but a little variation. And then I'm going to build that over time rather than just going in and saying, say, I'm going to do a bunch of lunges and body weight squats and pull up some push-ups. And the next day I go in, I'm going to do some more body weight squats, but then some bench pressing and just kind of like sporadic all over the place. Like sure you're getting some work done, but it's not going to build for a run program. So it's kind of like stacking up miles for say training for a marathon, right? Like if you just went out and just randomly ran every day and the distances were all over and there's no steady build to it, it's not good. You're going to get fit. Sure. But you're not going to perform that well when you come to race day. And the same goes strength training so lack of progression is probably the biggest thing i see over time yeah. what about warm-up how do you what what is a good way of going like with with running you can obviously start out with a walk and you can start with a slow jog and you pick up the pace what about strength training sure the old school of thought and kind of the old school running world is kind of just your traditional stretching, right? But that's really kind of in the gym, what we want to avoid a little bit. Because if you think about strength work, you think about elasticity, right? You want some spring to whatever the movement pattern that you're training is. And so the three kind of main horsemen that I push for athletes is soft tissue work to kind of prep the tissue. So whether that's foam rolling, taking a lacrosse ball, some manual massage, um, mobility work, because rather than just stretching a certain movement pattern we want to actually start greasing a joint up so if we're squatting that day we want to actually make sure the hips are greased and moving through a different range of motion and then some activation work which typically like banded works really good for that and what activation work is basically flipping the light switches on from the brain into wherever we're about to train so if i'm going into a lower body day for example i'm probably going to do some lateral band walks and some different banded movements to fire up my glutes and my hips and my hamstrings and my quads because I want those switches flipped on before I get underweight rather than just, you know, it's kind of like when you wake up in the morning. If the light slowly turns on, it's a little friendlier wake up. But if you just throw the light on and slam the music real loud, you're going to jump out of bed and, you know, feel like garbage. So the biggest thing is, like I said, soft tissue work, mobility, and activation work rather than just stretching and jumping into a warm-up set. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's so easy. Whenever... I often see it even at group runs. You join a group run and everyone just seems to go like from the moment you leave to like a full sprint within literally like a minute. But I do see that happen with strength training too, that people just right away start grabbing the heavy weights and start going for it. And like, and a really, a really good metric of it is like, if you just got up right now and did a body weight squat versus in an hour, if you spent 10 minutes stretching your hip, loosening your hips up and, you know, moving a little bit before and then did a body weight squat, it would just feel drastically different. And then if you apply that to anything with load, it's going to be the exact same concept. So for sure. Is it better for runners to lift heavy or lift low weight with high reps so that goes back a little bit kind of to one of the first things i said in the vein of this conversation just speaking that there, your hypothetical training is specifically geared around run performance 
We're going to generally want more volume, so high reps, a little bit lower weight. But there is a place for some high, um, some heavier loads. And a lot of that's for injury prevention more than anything. So big movers, squatting, hinging like a deadlift is are areas that we can probably throw some heavier loads in. But in general, we're going to want to look for a higher volume. And rather than just kind of alternating between like a heavy week and a high volume weight or week, you eventually can just add weight to that volume. So it's like use lunges, for example, starting off with some lunge work with some higher volume, we'll really get the glutes, hamstrings, hips really fired up. But as you progress through that six or eight week block, instead of decreasing volume, you would just add some weight to it to increase the load and time under tension. Because when you're prepping specifically for running, it's time under tension you're trying to work towards. Because obviously, if you're on your feet for an hour on a run, that's a long time to be moving. And so having a really heavy two rep back squat isn't going to transfer directly to that very well. But being able to knock out some high volume lunges and some good long form kind of work through the hamstrings and hips is really kind of the, what we want to aim for. So generally speaking, higher volume over lower volume. When So so there's two different elements we can look at, right? We can look at the volume, but we can also look at the rest or recovery time in between. What about the yep. recovery time over there? Like, let's say we're doing pull-ups. Do we want to have like one to two minutes in between or do we want to go like three to five minutes in between there? For most for most people that are training for, we'll say just generally longer runs, let's say like 10K and up, we're going to just basically at least a one-to-one -one work rest ratio. So if a set takes you 90 seconds, you want to typically rest at least 90 seconds as well. But more often than not, it's kind of, you want to go by feel. So you want to feel like you're recovered to the point that you can perform about 90% of your previous set. So if I'm doing five sets of pull-ups, for example, and I, I do 15 pull-ups my first round, I want to rest long enough that I can get probably at least close to 10 or 12 that next round. If I'm you know, getting back on the bar and I'm only not able to knock out four or five reps, I probably didn't take enough time off. Shorter, kind of more explosive-based stuff, you get into kind of the nuance of really measuring rest periods. But in terms of stuff for a longer, more endurance-based athlete, really just getting a full recovery is probably the most important thing. So at minimum, one-to-one -one work rest. That, that makes sense. What about, I think there's quite a few people on this call here who, yes, they're into running. They might not necessarily have that much experience with strength training, whereas mm -hmm. other people might have like a lot of gym equipment at home already. Mm -hmm. Like, are you able to do, like, I know you've put together several different follow along videos and half of those videos don't even include like any type of weights. Like sure. what, what, like for anyone over here wanting to start setting up a consistent strength training routine, what are somewhat of the, the minimum required tools or can you get away with body weight only? Or if you would have to buy a few things, what would those things be that you would recommend? Sure. So if you think about kind of the way we move, there's typically, there's some nuance to this, but in general, you're either moving horizontally or vertically. So an example of a horizontal movement would be a bench press. You're moving along the horizon. An example of a vertical movement would be a pull up. You're moving vertically up and down. So pretty much say a program at home with no or minimal equipment, you want to find ways to move within both of those planes for as much of your body as you can. So upper body, lower body, anterior and posterior pressing and pulling and so at home if you just kind of run through in your head some examples of all that you can do a fair amount of vertical work squatting lunging step ups anything like that is really the same version of a movement you're going to do in a gym flex flexion of the hips and the knees just you're not going to load it the same way just because you're not loading it with a barbell on your back doesn't mean that you're not getting the benefits from it and then in terms of upper body you have pushing and pulling is typically your main primary movers so you have push-ups and you have various ways of angling that, right? And the same with pull-ups and chin-ups. You can play with different grips and widths. So you can get a lot done with really minimal equipment to a point. If you're pretty proficient in terms of strength work, if you're a pretty strong runner, you're going to get to a point where you're finding you have to throw almost an unnecessary amount of volume to feel like you're getting some work done at home. But if you're pretty new to strength work, you can get away with a, a strictly body weight program and some kind of nice low entry kind of pieces of equipment would be some resistance bands, usually one or two kettlebells or a set of dumbbells up to 15, 20, 25 pounds will get people mostly what they need. 
Um, I have clients that I work with that they have the adjustable dumbbells up to 50 or 60 pounds, but they never touch anything above 30. So when people ask, you know, hey, I want to gra grab a few things for home, I usually say grab a couple bands and then grab 15, 20 and 25 pound dumbbells a set of each. And those three things, you're going to be able to get a lot of work done for a long time. And then beyond that, you know, it gets a little more complicated. But at that point, you're getting into the more advanced territory for strength work. For sure. What are your thoughts on weight vests? Like not just for strength training, but even for running. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of, I call it rucking, but carrying weight for distance. And so whether that's in a weight vest or in a rucksack loaded with a plate or sandbag or whatever, I find it builds a lot of joint resiliency, ankles, knees, and feet. And it's a nice way to, I prefer athletes going out and carrying weight, to be honest, over just going out for a shakeout run or junk miles. Because, you know, if you put yourself into the end stages of a race, whether it's a marathon or an ultra, when it's like, what's the common thing we see? We see people hunched over crossing the finish line because their posterior chain's broken down. And that's typically where we break down first. If you spend some time under weight, you're going to have that brace built a lot differently than if you haven't. And so I'm a huge proponent of, I don't, I'm not a big fan of running with the vest. I think it's a lot of unnecessary impact on joints. I know people that swear by it, but Personally, I you know, I go out with my dog and I have my weight vest on sometimes just because I'm like, hey, I'm out four or five miles a day. Why not throw a little load on it on days I'm not running hard and my hips are getting a little bit more load to bear. And I've noticed that on years I carry more weight, I hold up much better in the end stages of big efforts. And I think that's a big part of it. For anyone listening, what would be a good weight to start out with? This is for both men and women. You definitely want to ease into it because what we see most often is you, you, you're at risk of developing some stress fractures if you just jump into going and doing a 10 mile, you know, hike with 30 pounds. So I have anyone that's new to it, I have everyone start with 10 pounds and I say, go out for a mile and see how it feels. And then that's usually a pretty good gauge. If you can go out and carry 10 pounds for a mile you know, you can inch it up to the point that a runner specifically training for running doesn't need to go much over 20 pounds at any point, whether it's a weight vest or a pack, a man or woman, no matter what your strength level is, you never want to end a load carrying session just exhausted and trashed. You should never be hunched over. Like you should, you know, take the pack off, the vest off, feel like you did some work, but you never want to take that to a point of breakdown. Unless you're training for a super specific like mountain objective where you know you're going to have to carry a 50 pound pack, you know, for three days in the mountains. But yeah, I definitely, you know, keeping it under 10K once or twice a week, really awesome way to kind of add some extra engine building in there. Yeah. Quick, quick chat question here. Yeah. Rest means no movements or walking a bit also? In terms of between strength work, like at a gym, say you're, you know, in between sessions or sets, it's really mostly kind of personal preference. I, I kind of usually walk a little lap around my area, but the, the difference between just sitting there standing, um, pretty nuanced. Yeah. So I would say just whatever feels good to you. Yeah. Can you discuss knee strength and stability? Like knee issues come up so frequently with runners. Yep. And even in some of the questions submitted, some people said like some strength exercises I cannot do because I have knee issues. Can you talk a little bit more through that? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, like anyone that has spent a lot of time running has some degree of a knee problem, even if it's not causing pain. Like we all have small tears in our meniscus and, you know, whatever it may be. And it's, you know, even if it's totally pain free, there's usually some dysfunction going on. One of the best things I find for athletes to kind of keep both knee pain away, knee stability strong, and also to work around pain are isometrics and eccentrics. And so isometrics would be a movement that doesn't involve movement. So an example of that with a bilateral movement, meaning two legs would be dropping down into a squat to the point of comfort and then holding it for a set period of time. So maybe if squatting with weight causes you pain and you feel like, Hey, I can't go squat, but I can descend halfway down into a squat pain-free. We've stopped before that point of pain. And we go through sets of just holding that for 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds with the idea of being over time, we're building up some strength around that joint without pushing through pain. And you can do the same thing with something like a split squat or a lunge. And so that's usually a good first plan of attack. If a certain move gives you pain in the full range of motion, try shortening the range of motion and go into an isometric hold there. 
if you can build up some strength around that, and then we start working on eccentrics, which is the lengthening portion of a movement. So on a squat, that would be the descent or on a lunge, same thing, we're descending. And so you focus on, again, very slow controlled descents into that movement, stopping between a point of pain and then working through that limited range of motion with some slower, more tempo-based stuff. And over time, the goal is between the two of those, that range of motion you're able to work in should increase. And then to a point that, hey, all of a sudden, now I can actually squat to depth with no weight. And then we build strength there. And then from there, we build into squatting with some weight and building up over time. But kind of a combination of isometric, eccentric, and also making sure we're training unilaterally and bilaterally. So unilaterally, meaning one leg, bilaterally, meaning two. So spending time in both squat types of positions, hinge positions, as well as split positions. So single leg stuff as well, because oftentimes we kind of just train in one or two planes. But if you think of yourself as kind of a 360, you know, angle, we want to try to train in as many angles as we can and get strong in those angles. And that's really going to hammer everything down. Spot on. Here's another good one by Andrew Block. Mm -hmm. What would be a simple workout that anyone can find time for to make enough of a gain in strength as in 10, 15 minutes? So no sure. excuse to be had. Like, so before we dive into that, I do want to just mention that resource that we talked about earlier. Yep. And so I just, I just want to share it real quick because here's basically, are you guys able to see my screen? Yes. Here's basically the blog. So here are the four different follow along videos that you have put together over here. So it's, it's this one, 10 minutes strength follow along. Like some have actual kettlebells and weights, whereas others do not where it's purely body weight. Mm -hmm. So here's like an initial one, like four videos that are already great resources, but high level would absolutely love to hear more. Yeah, so if I'm kind of talking to somebody and they ask me that question, I would just have them ask themselves a few questions. I would ask, have them themselves, how many days a week do I wanna run through this? Am I doing this twice a week, once a week? Am I doing this four days a week? And then based on the frequency and the amount of time available, I'm going to run through four things. I'm going to run through an upper body push, an upper body pull, and a lower body push, and a lower body pull. And that might mean I only have enough time to do one exercise for each of those movements, but I'm going to pick a time frame. I'm going to do 10 to 12 reps of everything, and I'm just going to cycle through for that time period. So an example of that might be, push-ups, pull-ups, body weight squats, and glute bridges. So really simple, you know, it's nothing sexy, but it's efficient, it's effective, you don't need any equipment for that. And that's gonna give you some meat and potatoes work done right there. Say those, say, say those for one more time, a bit slower. So, yep. So we would say, if I have say really short on time, 12 minutes, my upper body push would be a push-up. My upper body yep. pull would be a pull-up or a chin-up. Lower body press would be a body weight squat. And then the lower body pole would be a glute bridge. And so could you, could you show me those last two? And sorry to like throw you like don't mean to throw throw you off over there, but I think yeah. when you mentioned those things, I don't know if everyone over here knows what you're talking about. Yeah. So the glute bridge will be easier for me to talk through because it involves me laying on the floor. So a glute bridge is basically laying flat on the floor with your he feet pressed flat on the ground. You're driving into your heels, pressing your glutes and your butt yep. up towards the ceiling, squeezing and then descending. And then a body weight squat is similar to, you know, a back squat or a goblet squat. It's just using no weight, basically. So standing tall, sitting down on your heels going to about 90 degrees and then standing tall from there. And so like I said, that's a super bare bones. But if you did that for 12 minutes and you cycled through a set of 12 of each of those as many times as you could in 12 minutes, you're not going to, you know, it's going to, it's going to feel like you did something and you could have an iteration of that a few days a week, you know, some different examples of those movement patterns, but same setup, or you could say, I only have two days a week. I could go through those two, that same workout twice a week for the next three weeks. And then in three weeks, same setup, but I'm going to throw some different movements in there and just give myself a little variety. So bare bones, keeping an idea for an upper body push, upper body pull, lower body push, lower body pull will give you some bang for your buck in a short amount of time. And the good part is too, as you progress throughout this, it's going to become easier, right? And so we can start making it a little bit more difficult. For example, with the push-up, we can change the hand positioning. With the pull-up, 
once we grab the bar wider, it's going to start getting more challenging and it starts to work yeah. out different parts to some extent. Once we start doing like the squat, you can carry some weights. And so there's still yeah. different ways throughout that that we can make it harder. So. Yeah, you can get a lot of work done just by playing, like you said, with angles, with reps, with pace and tempo. And so for someone that's really just trying to get some work done around the run, you can get a lot done with very little in terms of equipment. It was a good question by Ashley, kind of a follow up on what you just said. How little yeah. can I get away with while still having a positive impact? That's the, the million dollar question. Generally, I tell people twice a week will give you some linear progression over time. And so, you know, it depends on the time you have available. If, if you do one session a week and it's a longer session, you're sure going to make more progress than if you didn't do that session. But in terms of something that you're actually going to notice, twice is typically kind of your minimum. And you can make a lot of forward progress with two good sessions a week, um, especially if you're running around that. One more question here. This one is by Ivan Acosta, one of our friends from Path Projects. I'd like to work program with a focus on hyper hypertrophy how do i pronounce hypertrophy that? I always, hypertrophy yeah, I always, <laughs> that's my dutch right there i always put that one. so an in, in, increase in body volume basically while running yeah. 30, 30 to 50 miles a week so that's like 50k to 70k a week sure. i have an idea on how i would structure my running training but how would you structure your actual strength training like can probably do strength three or four days a week yeah, so, you know, hypertrophy program is going to be built typically on rep schemes of like, we'll say eight to 12 reps of most movements, three to five sets. And then in terms of the number of movements, it's kind of based on how much time you have generally. For something like that, a workout should be pretty much no more than 60 minutes, maybe a little bit longer. And a three-day pretty classic split for that would be really a good bet for that. So an upper body push day, an upper body pull day, and then a lower body day. And what we mean by upper body push day would be horizontal pressing, like bench press patterns, push up patterns, as well as overhead pressing. So shoulder work, upper body pulling would be things like deadlifting, pull ups, rows, things along that line. And then a lower body day would be exactly what you'd expect, you know, quad work, hamstrings and glutes. The one thing I'll say with hypertrophy work is obviously you're adding size if that's your goal with that type of training. And so that is going to feel a little bit different in terms of how it interacts as a runner. But a lot of people, they have some aesthetic goals built in with their running programming. So a program that's built around something like that, where you're working in kind of mid rep ranges of 10 to 12 reps is still going to give you a lot of positive benefits. I think there's a, a more movement to, we'll call them just bigger runners now. And I think to have that, you need to be able to fuel that muscle tissue. And so, yeah, you can work within that 10 to 12 rep range. Three days a week would be a really solid split for that. Like I said, upper body push, upper body pull, and then a lower body day. With the lower body day, hopefully furthest away from your biggest run of the week just for the sake of keeping legs and hips fairly fresh yeah spot on it was not a good one what are like is there any difference let's say there's runners training for a road marathon mm -hmm. and there's runners training for like a mountain race or for like a trail race or a lot of a lot of elevation gain sure would you would you approach strength differently like, how do you go about that? There's definitely some shared components. You know, there's obviously the movement pattern of running is generally the same for both. Someone who's training for, we'll just say something more rugged, for lack of a better term, whether that means more elevation gain, um, less quality terrain, trails, mountains, whatever it may be. The main things we're going to encounter that they're going to need some specific work around is going to be some deceleration work because you're going to be descending a lot more typically than a road run. And so the way we work on we work on deceleration is basically think of running downhill as tapping the brakes every time you step downhill. So we need to train the mechanisms around that, which the best way we can go about that is with those kind of previously mentioned isometrics and eccentric work. So really slow descent on a lunge and holding the bottom of a squat, maybe even with weight for long periods of time. And we want to spend time under tension in that sense. And then in terms of the opposite of that, we also have more of a climbing aspect, right? So 
typically some form of a step up is going to be a really nice thing to play with as more of a trailer mountain runner of varying heights, right? Because obviously on a trail with a lot of climbing, each step up is not measured the same. So getting comfortable and getting your hips trained in a really high box step up versus maybe some heavier step ups, dumbbells in your hands on a lower step and just kind of training your body to move through a little bit more of a dynamic universe versus a road runner who say their goal is to a little more performance based in terms of speed is going to be able to want to maybe throw a little bit of explosive stuff. So more plyometric based box jumps, kind of working on taking the impact that a hard concrete, you know, base is going to be putting into the knees. So we want to work on landing, kind of training our body to, to receive shock a little bit better. You're also just going to be tend to hit harder on a hard surface like that. Last November, we were... Well, like basically last fall, we we're in the Grand Canyon mm-hmm. and we were doing a photo shoot for Pat, for Pat. Sure. We had a bunch of camera equipment on the back and we were going into the Grand Canyon. Yeah. And you start at the rim at 6,000 foot and you go all the way down. You descend 5,000 foot to the Colorado yeah. River. This was just a downhill. The amount that it beat up our quads was absolutely unbelievable. And I think sometimes yeah. people forget that it's not necessarily the climbing uphill. It's very often the downhill that every time I experience that, I'm like, I wish I would have trained my quads more. I wish I would have like done some mm-hmm. more specific workouts for these areas. But yeah, I don't think we can underestimate that sometimes. No, I think anyone that's done a long ultra in the mountains knows that fear of, you know, that last quarter of the race, seeing a downhill, you know, as shocking as it is, ends up being worse than a big climb for a lot of folks. So it's definitely something that can be trained for, you know, the more muscle you have around that cap knee capsule, the more you're going to take that shock better. And the more you've trained, you know, in slow tempo based stuff, the better you're going to handle it to a point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, few more questions. I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but there were so many good questions that came through here. Yeah. There's quite some runners who experience lower back pain. Do you have any thoughts on strength training exercises if you have like whether it's strength, mobility, anything in particular? Yes, this could have to do with your running form, your footwear and any of those kind of things. But let's take this from a strength training aspect. Yeah. Chronically, I mean, most people are compromised through their posterior chain. So when we say posterior chain, we just generally mean your backside. That low back pain that a lot of people are experiencing, a lot of times will come from kind of, I call it the cranky neighbor. So it might be dysfunction in your glutes. It might be higher up in your thoracic spine around your shoulders from being seated all day and internally rotated through your shoulders. It might mean you're in the car a lot, you know, and we're here rotated forward. And so oftentimes the thing that's causing the pain is something around where the pain is. And so if you suffer from kind of chronic low back pain or just general feelings of weaknesses, and you, it's always good to make sure that there's not like an actual diagnosis first, right? Like a disc issue or something kind of more serious. If it just feels like you're chronically weak and kind of just hold on to that tension, really taking some time to strengthen the glutes and the hamstrings and the low back and the upper back will really do a lot of work for that. And it kind of goes back to, we all have that classic image of people like hunched over at the finish line of a marathon or an ultra and, you know, back rounded forward, hands on the knees. And the reason that happens is because they broke down in their posterior chain. And so if you think of it kind of like a crane holding you upright, you know, there's big tethers that are holding you upright the whole time. The stronger those tethers are, the more upright we're going to be and the more support you're going to have around that low back. So movement wise, we love bridging patterns, whether that's that glute bridge we talked about earlier. Deadlifting is a fantastic movement pattern for people. I like for runners, for almost all my athletes, so deadlifting is essentially just picking a barbell off the ground and putting it right back down. You can do the same thing with dumbbells and kettlebells. I like to have runners and most of my endurance athletes do it with either dumbbells, a kettlebell, or a trap bar, so a hex bar. It's basically the bar you stand inside of and there's handles on either side. The barrier to entry is a lot lower. The risk to a a back injury is much lower, and it's just generally a more functional way to lift weight off the floor. So anything that's basically a hinging pattern. So if you're like, I'm going in the gym tomorrow, I want to get some ideas. If you just look up hinging patterns, you're going to come up with some good ideas to get into that. And then upper body pulling. Don't shy away from pull-ups, chin-ups, 
dumbbell rows, things like that. We want to try to paint that whole back. So if there was kind of a heat signature on your back as you're going through a workout, we'd like to try to light it all up from basically the base of your neck down to the back of your knees. Yes. Very well said. A lot of runners talk about strengthening that core. Can you talk a little bit more with what is meant with that and what are some of the ways that we can do this kind of in addition to some of the things you just talked about here? Yeah. So I think when it's mentioned, typically people aren't thinking about it quite right. We think about core as, you know, our six little box right up front and that's about it. And so when we think about core, we really want to think about it as a big waistband that wraps both sides of your midline. So it's front and back, anterior and posterior. It's your low back. It is in your entire abdomen. And so there's traditionally two ways to train that. It's flexion and extension, which an example of that would be a sit-up, leg raise, something where your hips are flexing and extending or it's rotation based. So, you know, uh, a Russian twist where you're seated and rotating left to right. We've all seen cable twists and all things, you know, things like that. So it's important when you think about training that midline to train it dynamically, meaning you want to train both of those movement patterns. You're not just in doing one or two of those. And then we really want to kind of think about what are my needs as a runner? So like I'm a trail runner. And so I have a lot of steps where when I step, I don't want my body to rotate, right? And I need my core to pull that into place. And so we do work called anti-rotation work, which is exactly what the name implies. It stops your body from rotating. So what that might look like is standing in kind of a tall athletic stance with a band in your hands attached to a, a bar off to the side, pressing out and just holding that. So the work is being done when I am stopping my body from rotating in. And if you translate that to a trail, so I'm training here, doing this work, all of a sudden, if I'm out running and I step down on my left foot and my body wants to rotate here, which then might pull my hip up, I've trained myself to stay centered and more focused in terms of that forward movement. So kind of training a variety of realms and not just, hey, I did a bunch of sit-ups and some twists with a band or a medicine ball. We want to work on both, you know, flexion and extension, rotating, but also anti-rotation work, stopping things from rotating. And there's a lot of ways to do that, but the anti-rotation is a really big one for injury prevention. And even if you just kind of go through the dynamics of a running gait, your body is naturally wanting to rotate. And so the more we've trained ourselves to not rotate through that midline, really the better we're going to even just perform as a runner once again when you're talking through like some of the some of the counter movements over here all you need is a is a rubber band or all you need is it's it's very simple to train some of these things you don't need a whole lot of bells and whistles with it and you can do anti-rotation work in a doorway, right? You can stand in a doorway with your hands together and press the hands into the doorway, kind of into the frame of the door. And, you know, you're not rotating, but your body wants to rotate into the door. And so, you know, you're creating tension without movement, which is what we want. So, yeah, you can do it. Very, very minimal equipment. Yeah. What about this question comes up sometimes too. Any suggestions on skipping rope? For strengthening the lower body yeah so if you kind of think about the mechanisms of what you're training skipping rope it's you know a lower leg movement primarily so your calves um, your soleus and your gastroc the two main muscles of your calf are going to get a lot of work there the one kind of thing people want to watch for that is if they're jumping into it new is to take it pretty conservatively at the start because you can kind of overactivate that Achilles, the versa sacs around it. So I see a lot of people, they yeah, I'm gonna throw some rope skipping into my sessions. They get into it a little bit too hard, too quick, and all of a sudden their Achilles are inflamed. They've got some, you know, bursitis in their heels. Um, but definitely a nice way to kind of, you know, obviously it simulates a running gait and kind of that repeated impact. So definitely would be a nice way to train the low legs and get the volume aspect that we talked about earlier through that. Yeah, perfect. Let's see. There was one more question here that just came in the chat. And this is from Jason Cohen. What's up, Jason? Good to, good to see you on here. He asked, let's see, any favorite stretches for injury prevention, ones that you cannot live without? Before we dive in, I want to say to anyone here who's into running documentaries, check out, this is Jason's running documentary, Heavy as Lead, from 300 cool. pounds to running the Leadville 100. Right. And it's an incredible journey that he has put together. It almost has a million views, this video. 
what I will say, <laughs> post it in the live chat. But it's uh, we'll get him to awesome. a, we'll get him to a million now. Exactly. No, Jason is a beast, so it's uh, it's awesome. But yeah, curious to hear your thoughts here. Favorite stretches for injury prevention? Yeah. So generally speaking, stretching is not necessarily a huge mechanism for injury prevention as much as mobility based stuff. And to kind of distinguish between what is mobility and what is stretching is probably important and if we think about mobility work we want to say identify a joint or two so my hips for example and we want to start playing with kind of maximal ranges of motion that my hip can move in some different directions and ways and over time the goal is to increase what that range of motion is ultimately that's probably the biggest single thing you can do to prevent injury is increase the range of motion to a healthy point that a joint can move through rather than just stretching muscle tissue Um, there's a process called controlled articular rotations cars for short c-a-r and it's kind of a series of movements around all the main joints in the body that you can do a lot of variations of a lot of different versions of it but the idea is you're training an individual joint to move through the maximal range of motion it can and over time improve that without helping it by using other joints so an example would be being kind of in a kneeling position with my shoulder and drawing a true maximal outer range of motion around that joint but focusing on not opening and closing my chest at all, rotating into it, because the goal is to see, hey, this is what this joint can move truly on its own. And then over time, practicing that and both lubricating the joint, stretching out the musculature around it, and just building some more functional mobility. And the more domains you can move in, the less likely you are to be hurt in them, basically. Yeah. One more question, kind of going back to the reps that we were talking about. There was a chat clarification about this. Or what is the number of reps that you consider high volume? We'll say for the sake of most you know, endurance-based athletes, 15 to 25. And that is, again painting with a fairly broad stroke, but there's not a lot of occasions you're going to work beyond a rep scheme of 25 um, as an endurance athlete, unless you get into some really high level stuff and, you know, some personal preference stuff, anything 12 and under is going to either be focusing more on hypertrophy. So that lean muscle mass or more power strength based stuff. But if you're working, we'll just say generally 15 to 25 would be that higher volume. And then what are you building to? Is it typically max lift or total volume? So again, kind of going back to the idea of we never want to negatively impact run performance. There's very seldom going to be periods where you're actually building to anything near a, a one rep, two rep max as a runner. Again, if our goal for the point of this discussion is just to talk about run performance, we always want to work on most, a lot of runners are familiar with an RPE scale. So if we said RPE of seven to eight, typically on most working sets is kind of where we want to live. So we want to always have a little gas in the tank. We're not typically training till failure, but we also want to feel like we're activated and working. So as we build again, like say for an example, if I'm going to do sets of, if I'm doing five sets of 15 squats today for a workout, The first set might be a little on the lighter side. I'm kind of going to feel out where I'm at for the day. And then the next four sets, I'm either going to have a consistent weight that feels challenging around that seven or eight on the RPE scale, or I'm going to slowly build and kind of feel out where my body's at for that day. Always having gas in the tank, never going to a point of failure, but progressively over those sets, getting to a point where maybe those last two sets, I have things dialed in a little bit better. I have one more very important question. But yes. before we do, where can people find out more about you, Kyle? Like, I yeah. know you offer one-on-one coaching in both strength training and in um, endurance coaching. Where can people find yeah. more about you? The best place is probably either on my Instagram. It's 100 Mile Kyle, Or you can email me, kylelongfitness at gmail.com. You can reach out with questions. If you have any thoughts on coaching, wanting more information, I can definitely give you both. But also just happy to answer any more questions we didn't get to today on either. Cool. Well, then one more closing, closing thought question, though. Do you have yes. any more, like we've already discussed a lot over here about strength training for runners. Do you have any other closing thoughts about like recommendations for athletes to improve, to become a stronger, healthier, happier athlete, to really set themselves up in, in training success? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is 
the thing that things I like to see my athletes do the most is have some goals through the year that you're actually going to build towards. And those don't necessarily just need to be a race. It can be a self-guided project. It can be some performance-based stuff in terms of times, distances, and really kind of take a look at where you're at and what needs to be there and actually make a list of what needs to happen to get you there. I think a lot of people, they say, hey, I've run a marathon and I'd, I'd like to go run my first 50K later this summer. But that's kind of about as far as the planning goes. And they might just kind of generally increase their mileage or maybe go to the gym once a week. But if you really sit down and actually build a plan up to that and have some structure around it, you're really going to want to enjoy the journey to get there a little bit more and you're going to perform a lot better. And that's where, you know, having a run coach or a run program or having some system that you follow, whatever it may be, is really, I think, the most valuable thing an athlete can do. And it will make your time training much more enjoyable. I think I'm guilty sometimes if I look back on a three month period, I'm like, I had kind of just floundered a little bit in my sessions. I was just kind of, I was going in, I was showing up, I was training hard. But I didn't really get anywhere with it. And, you know, in that three months, if I, the next three months, if I actually put my head down, kind of have some structure around it, the benefits are just massive compared to if you're just showing up every day. So just generally building structure, whether it's run program, run planning, strength work, will just really do you wonders. Spot on. I just want to add one thing to that, kind of from my own perspective as well. Yeah. Is sometimes I think it's, it's really good to indeed have a base fundamental of like, hey, here's the training schedule I want to follow. Here's the workout plan I want to follow. Yet... Sometimes things happen on the daily day to day, right? Like our kid might get sick, keep us awake at night, something might come up at work. So that flexibility to kind of adjust on the day to day and move things around versus hundred percent rigid sticking to a training schedule is pretty important as well. But absolutely. And again, at least having an idea of like, Hey, this is what I'm aiming for, for the week. This is my bigger picture goal. This is how I'm breaking it up. Like you're saying, there's a lot of people who are just kind of wandering around and having some of that structure is absolutely helpful there. So. Yeah, none of us are David Goggins. We don't have to wake up and go <laughs> run 40 miles every day because the notepad says to. So it's, it's good to listen to life a little bit too. So Exactly, exactly. Well, Kyle, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And like, yeah, thank you. in the, in the ch- chat over here, Kyle's details and then also pathprojects.com slash blog where you can find all these follow along videos. So excellent. Thanks so much for joining everyone. Replay will be available as well. And there's going to be some more videos with Kyle coming up at some point down the line as well. So yep. Thanks, Thank guys. you guys. Have a good one. Bye now.